These are the five things I learned from Mark Minivini. So who is Mark Minivini? Mark Minivini is one of the most successful and well-known traders in the world. So let's take a quick look at Mark Minivini's background before I share with you the five things I learned from him. Mark Minivini is the winner of the 1997 US Investing Championship. During the championship, Mark Minivini went only pure stock, while going up against traders who used massive leverage in the form of options and futures. Despite that, Mark Minivini managed to achieve 155% annual returns, placing him first in the US Investing Championship in 1997. Mark Minivini is also one of the stock market wizards that was featured in Jack Schrager's best-selling book. On top of all these achievements, Mark Minivini also managed to turn his personal trading account from a few thousand dollars to a few million dollars and he generated an average of 220% per year for more than 5 consecutive years, generating a total return of 33,500% in the process. That is a massive amount of returns, and that is what we as traders call super performance. To give you some context, the total amount of returns that Mark Minivini managed to generate during those years would have transformed a $100,000 account into more than $30 million in just 5 years. Just think about that, that is insane. And that is why Mark Minivini is considered one of the finest traders in the world. So in today's video, I'll be sharing with you the five things I learned from Mark Minivini. The first thing that I learned is Mark Minivini's trend template. And this trend template provides us guidance on when to go long on stocks. The reason for that is because we always want to buy with the trend. If we are looking to buy a stock, we want the stock to be trending upwards, as this allows the wind to be behind our backs. So we only want to buy stocks that are in a long-term uptrend. Mark Minivini's trend template provides us a basis to determine an uptrend. This is Mark Minivini's trend template and the criteria that he looked out for. The first criteria that he looks out for is for the stock price to be above both the 150-day moving average and the 200-day moving average. The second criteria is for the 150-day moving average to be above the 200-day moving average. And the third is for the 200-day moving average to be trending up for at least one month. Fourth is for the 50-day moving average to be above both the 150-day moving average and the 200-day moving average. And the fifth is for the current stock price to be at least 25% above its 52-week low. And the sixth is for the current stock price to be within at least 25% of its 52-week high. And the last one is for the relative strength of the stock to be high. Let's take a look at this individual criteria. The first criteria is for the stock price to be above both the 150-day moving average and the 200-day moving average. The blue line on this price chart indicates the 150-day moving average and the red line on this price chart indicates the 200-day moving average. We can divide this price chart into three different areas. So this will be the first area and then this will be the second and third areas. On the leftmost of the price chart, the stock price is above both the 150-day and 200-day moving average. So we put a tick over here. For the middle portion, the stock price is below both the 150-day moving average and 200-day moving average. So we will put a cross over here. And for the right side of the chart, the stock price is above both the 150-day moving average and 200-day moving average. So we will put a tick over here. So based on the first criteria, which is to ensure that the stock is above both the 150-day moving average and 200-day moving average, we should only consider going long on the stock on the left side of the chart and the right side of the chart, and avoid going long at the middle part of the chart. That's the first criteria. The second criteria is for the 150-day moving average to be above the 200-day moving average. Using the same price chart, for this point here and for this point over here, the 200-day moving average, which is the red line, is above the 150-day moving average, which is the blue line. So based on the second criteria, we want to go long on a stock when the 150-day moving average is above the 200-day moving average, which is at this part over here and this part over here. The question you might probably have is, but Linus, if we go long over here, we would have lost money. And at this point over here, the 150-day moving average is still above the 200-day moving average. And that is true. During that substantial drop in prices, the 150-day moving average is still above the 200-day moving average. And the reason is because of their longer time frame. So for the 150-day moving average and the 200-day moving average, because they are taking into account a longer time frame such as the 150-day and 200-day respectively, there is a greater amount of lag in the moving averages. But the point is this, we do not want to use this individual criteria by themselves or in isolation. What we want to look out for ideally is for all these criteria to be met. That's the second criteria. Now let's take a look at the third criteria. The third criteria is for the 200-day moving average to be trending up for at least a month, preferably four or five months or longer. An example would be this price chart. On this price chart, you'll see that the 200-day moving average, as indicated by the red line, is trending up very nicely. In fact, from this point onwards, you'll see that the 200-day moving average has been trending up for at least four to five months already. The fourth criteria is for the 50-day moving average to be above both the 150-day moving average and the 200-day moving average. The green line is the 50-day moving average, the blue line is the 150-day moving average, and the red line is the 200-day moving average. 
So for this section of the price chart, the stock meets the criteria and we can determine that the stock is on an uptrend because the 50-day moving average is above the 150-day moving average and is also above the 200-day moving average. The fifth criteria is for the price of the stock to be at least 25% above its 52-week low. So for example, at this point over here, say the stock is at its 52-week low. What the criteria tells us is that we only want to invest in the stock when it's 25% above its 52-week low, so from this point onwards. And the sixth criteria is for the stock price to be within at least 25% above its 52-week high. The closer the price of the stock is to its 52-week high, the better. So if the 52-week high price of the stock is over at this point over here, then ideally we only want to buy the stock within this 25% range. And for the seven criteria, we want the relative strength of the stock to be high. Relative strength measures the strength of the price movement of a stock against a benchmark. In most cases, the benchmark is the S&P 500 index. So if the strength of the price movement of the stock is higher than the S&P 500 index, we say that the relative strength for that stock is high and vice versa. So for this criteria, we ideally want the relative strength of the stock to be high and for the relative strength line to be preferably in an uptrend for at least 6 weeks. So for this price chart, we have one type of relative strength. And for this relative strength indicator, 0 is set as the benchmark for the S&P 500. So if the relative strength line of this stock is above 0, it means that the stock has a high relative strength. And if the relative strength line is below 0, then it means that the relative strength of this stock is weak. So the seventh criteria is for the stock to have a high relative strength. Those are the seven criteria for Mark Minivini's trend template. And the second thing that I learned from Mark Minivini is losing streaks. He mentions that even the best traders encounter losing streaks. And no traders are immune to them. And how we respond to these losing streaks determines how profitable we are in the stock market. Since all of us experience losing streaks in the stock market, Mark Minivini shares some ways to deal with these losing streaks. The first way is to tighten up our stop losses. If you don't know what stop losses are, I have a video on stop losses on my channel which I will link in this video over here. In a nutshell, stop losses help us control our risks in the stock market. When we are encountering losing streaks, Mark Minivini advises to tighten up our stop losses. So if our stop losses is at 2%, then maybe we can tighten up our stop losses to 1%. The second way is to settle for smaller profits. Before we enter our trade in the markets, we need to have a profit target. So our profit target can be 4%, 5%, 10% or even more. But during losing streaks, Mark Minivini suggests to settle for smaller profits. So if we are targeting a 10% profit, we can maybe adjust our profit target to be at around 7 or 5% instead. The third way to deal with losing streaks is that if you are trading with leverage, get off leverage immediately. And the fourth tip that Mark Minivini shared is to reduce our position size and exposure in the markets. So if we are exposing 10% of our capital in the markets during normal times, then during losing streaks, we want to look to cut that exposure down. So during losing streaks, if we follow this advice from Mark Minivini, and we reduce our position size and exposure in the markets, then when is the time to scale back to our normal levels? Mark Minivini suggests to scale back up when our win rate and risk to reward ratio improves. Your win rate in the stock market is the number of winning trades you have as a percentage of the total number of trades that you have taken. And the risk to reward ratio is the amount of risk that you are risking to potentially generate a certain amount of returns. So you want to scale back up your position size and exposure in the markets when your win rate and risk to reward ratio improves. The third thing that I learned from Mark Minivini is age and probabilities. The difference between an amateur and a pro trader is consistency. And the consistency that we are talking about here is the returns in the stock market. There will be amateurs who are able to generate substantial returns in the stock market, but these returns usually do not last for long. So for example, one year the amateur may make a return of around 70%, but the next year he might lose 90% of his capital. And if you take a look at the amateur's returns, it tends to fluctuate a lot and there will be a lot of volatility. But for the pro, he or she might or might not generate such returns, such as 70% returns. However, the pro might generate 30% returns consistently year over year. And it is this consistency which separates the pro from the amateur. And in order to achieve this consistency, we need to have a positive mathematical probability or what we call H in the markets. Take this coin flip game as an example. Let's say we make $3 if we flip for the front and lose $1 if we flip for the back. And say this coin is an even two-sided coin which means that there is a 50-50 chance for flipping a front and flipping for a back. Do you think you have an edge in this game and do you think you'll play this game? You'll play this game, right? Because if you do your simple calculation, you know that you have a positive mathematical probability in this game. So for 100 flips for an even two-sided coin, we know that there's a 50% chance of flipping a front and a 50% chance of flipping a back. So for the front, there's a 50% chance. So our expected profit is 50 multiplied by $3, which will give us $150. 50 is the average number of times that we flip a front and $3 is the reward that we get for flipping a front. So our expected profit is $150. We also know that there's a 50% chance of flipping a back. Our expected loss is 50 multiplied by $1, which will give us a loss of $50. So again, 50 is the average time that we flip for a back 
and negative one dollar is the loss that we incur from flipping a bag. So what would the profit be for 100 flips? The profit simply would be $150 minus $50, which gives us a profit of $100. So on average, with age and probabilities in our favor, we'll make $100 for every 100 flips. So how many flips would you want to flip? You will want to flip as many times as possible, right? Because you know you have a positive age in this game. And the same thing is true in the stock market. If you have a positive mathematical probability or an age in the market, then you'll be able to consistently make money in the stock market. If you have an edge in the stock market, the next thing to consider is how to scale up your positions in the stock market. We know that with an edge in the stock market, over a large sample of trades, we will be profitable. So the next question is, how do we scale up to increase our position in our existing trades so that we can increase our profits in the stock market? Mark Minivini shared this example on how to scale up and add exposure in the market without adding additional risk to your capital. At the start, say you bought 1,000 shares of a company at $60.50 and set a stop loss at $15.50. So you buy 1,000 shares at $16.50 and you set your stop loss at $15.50. And after you bought the stock, the price of the stock went up. So the stock went up to $17.50 and you decided to add even more position at that point. You also bought another 1,000 shares at $17.50 and you set the new stock at $16.50 for all 2,000 shares. And the reason why we have 2,000 shares now is because you bought 1,000 shares at first at $16.50 and you bought another 1,000 shares at $17.50, which will give you a total of 2,000 shares. So you bought another 1,000 shares at $17.50. And you set the stop loss for all your 2,000 shares at $16.50. So at point B, even though you have an additional 1,000 shares and 2,000 shares in total, you are still risking $1,000 of your own capital, which was the same at point A. So if you take a look at point A, you bought 1,000 shares at $16.50 and you set a stop loss for this 1,000 shares at $15.50. So the total amount of risk that you are risking to your capital is 1,000 shares multiplied by $1, which we get from deducting $15.50 from $16.50. So the total risk to our capital at point A is $1,000. And the total risk to our capital at point B is also $1,000. Because at $17.50, we made a profit of $1,000. And we got a profit of $1,000 because we take 1,000 shares multiplied by $1. And that $1 difference is calculated from taking $17.50 minus $16.50. So at the price level of $17.50, we have a profit of $1,000. And this $1,000 finance our additional risk in the stock market. Point B, the total risk to our capital is $2,000 because we take 2,000 shares multiplied by the $1 difference between the buy point and the stop loss point. However, because of our paper profits that we made, the risk to our capital is reduced back to $1,000. And that is how we scale up our position and add exposure in the market without adding additional risk. So adding the additional 1,000 shares at $17.50 doubles the size of our position while still keeping the risk at $1,000. And this is because the profits finance the additional risk. So Mark Minivini managed to keep his drawdown low and at the same time make big returns by scaling into positions. And that is the fourth thing that I learned from Mark Minivini. The fifth thing that I learned is growth versus cheap. Many traders tend to avoid expensive stocks. But the thing with stocks with growth potential is, many of them appear expensive at first, but they will often get even more expensive in the future. While cheap stocks tend to get even cheaper in the future. Growth stocks by definition are stocks that have the potential to be super performers. And because of their potential, they are likely to be valued higher and we are likely to have to pay a premium for these stocks. In addition, these growth stocks also tend to be already moving up. On the other hand, cheap stocks that fell drastically and have underperformed the market is a warning, not a bargain. Mark Minivini mentions that sometimes we have to pay a premium for such stocks. And as traders in the stock market, we don't want to avoid such stocks just because they are expensive or because their valuations are very high. To recap, these are the five lessons that I learned from Mark Minivini and which I have shared with you in this video. So the first lesson is the trend template. And I shared with you the seven criteria to look out for as a basis to determine an uptrend. The second lesson is some ways to deal with losing streaks. The third is that in order to be consistently profitable in the stock market, we need to have an edge and for probabilities to align in our favor. And once we have an edge in the stock market, the next thing is on how to scale up our position so that we can increase our profitability in the stock market. And that is the fourth lesson that I learned from Mark Minivini on how to scale up. And the last lesson is the difference between growth stocks and cheap stocks. If you have enjoyed and learned something from this video, smash that like button because it will really help the channel grow and allow me to produce more content such as this. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss out on future videos such as this on investing, trading, and the stock market. I'll see you in those other videos to your financial success.